Okay, so uh, well, let's get it started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our today's EMU Zoom seminar. Uh, it's really my pleasure to welcome our today's speaker, uh, Dr. Benjamin Marsland. Uh, he's currently a full professor and the acting head of the School of Translational Medicine at uh, Monash University in Melbourne, uh, Australia. Uh, a very, very uh, brief introduction about Ben. Ben uh, completed his PhD training in immunology at uh, Melbourne uh, Institute of Medical Research, Wellington in New Zealand. And he then spent 14 years in Switzerland, first at the ZTH Zurich, and then as a uh, Coriata uh, Medical Research Fellow at the University H Hospital of Lausanne. So during that period, he received the ETH Lattice Prize and then the Leonard's Prize and the, the ERS COPD Research Awards. Uh, since 2018, Ben is a uh, Visker uh, Innovation Fellow, full, full professor, and co leads the GIN Discovery Program. And uh, he is also the deputy head of the School of Translational Medicine at Monash University in Australia. He maintains a visiting fellowship, uh, professorship at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, and uh, he also has a uh, co-founded three companies, and then currently is the editor-in-chief of Mucosal Immunology. So uh, the main focus of uh, uh, his research group uh, is on mucosal immunology, um, revolves around the microbiome and the metabolites in barrier tissues and how they influence asthma intestinal uh, inflammation and the lung fibrosis. So it's it's really great, Ben, uh, to join us today on this platform. And we, we highly appreciate it and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Pleasure. Thanks very much for the for the introduction and the opportunity. It's nice to be able to um, to share some of our um, work with uh, a new audience. Um, just, there we go. Um, so I'll go straight straight into the the theme of our our research, which um, revolves a lot around the uh, microbiome and uh, metabolites that are produced by microbes. And when we think about the microbiome, I think we typically um, immediately think about the gut, um, understandably so, because that's where the vast majority of microbes reside. And lots of research into host microbe interactions in the gut have yielded. Um, insights into how they they change um, all sorts of aspects of physiology and immunology. So if we just use short-chain fatty acids as an example, and um, this is really just the tip of the iceberg of microbial metabolites, but they're also some of the most studied. So I'm just using it as an example. Um, but short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate are uh, key energy sources for um, colonocytes, um, they power these cells. Uh, it's critical for uh, their function, wound repair, epithelial integrity. Um, they also um, directly activate immune cells, um, shaping the environment of, of the gut. And, and short-chain fatty acids um, are generally, in nearly every instance, seen um, as having health benefits. Um, but as I mentioned, this is the tip of the iceberg. There are lots and lots of other metabolites which are having functions, some of which we understand, others um, we don't yet. Um, and a lot of our focus is on trying to identify uh, different metabolites and how they, they have effects. But not so much focused on the gut, because if you zoom out from the gut and something which is becoming better understood but is not um, perhaps receiving as much attention as the, the local effects of metabolites is that these metabolites go throughout the body and they have effects um, in all of our organs and upon um, all aspects of our immune system. Uh, just as an example, uh, again, sticking with short-chain fatty acids, we know that those go into the circulation um, certainly at lower levels than what they are present in the gut, but they go into the circulation, they can influence our immune system at one of the most fundamental levels, that being bone marrow hematopoiesis, um, and cells that are shaped by uh, microbial metabolites in the bone marrow then migrate to different tissues. And in the past, we've done a lot of work on the on the lung. I'll show some of this today. Um, but we know that uh, when there's inflammation in the lung, the cells that are recruited from the bone marrow to the lung exert their effective function as determined by metabolites that they have seen previously, for example, in the bone marrow. 
But we also know that metabolites um, don't just go into the circulation, they go right into the tissues. And something that we're finding in many projects now is that metabolites which are produced in the gut can actually be found in the air spaces of the lungs. So if you do a bronchioalveolar lavage and look at what's in the, the, in the epithelium of the um, of lung cells and the lung tissue, you can find these gut metabolites. So they go everywhere and they have profound effects on all sorts of immune cells. And, and that's one of our, our key interests. But it's not just restricted to the lung. Um, the skin is another example of, of a tissue which is really affected by the gut and microbial metabolites. And today I'm going to take the opportunity to, to share a story about the skin. So I won't go into that right now. I'm going to show um, a lot of data related to that in a moment. I just want to make the point that a lot of our understanding comes from mouse models. Um, and I'm not going to go into this data, which was um, published quite recently. Um, but it, it is a high level takeaway from, from the study. We looked at children um, uh, early in life and we took samples from, um, from fecal samples, from the blood and from the airways. So bronchioalveolar lavages of these kids. So really, really challenging samples to get hold of. Um, you can't do this in healthy individuals because um, it's so invasive, but in, in sick kids, when you're studying them, you, you can. And so we were able to track microbes and metabolites in all of those different sites and see how they're interrelate, interrelated. Um, and, and really, the only thing I want to, you to take home from this um, slide is that there are metabolites which are unique to each of those compartments, as you'd expect. They all represent different ecosystems and metabolites are produced either endogenously by our own cells in those sites or by microbes that are specific to those sites. But there's also overlap. Um, and, um, and it really illustrates the fact that not just in mouse models, but in humans too, microbial metabolites um, are produced in multiple different sites, then they go into the circulation and go throughout the body where they have effects distally. Um, and and that's, that's really the basis for, for many of our, our research projects. So as I mentioned, the um, uh, first project I'd like to share with you today, I'm going to share two that are quite different, um, but the first one is um, related to the skin. And, uh, you know, as this... Um, seminar platform was created during COVID. This work was completed during COVID. And, and this is one of the only times I've, I've presented this work um, because uh, there wasn't any opportunity to go to, to conferences and um, and uh, describe it at the time. And then subsequently there were other projects to talk about. So it's a nice chance to talk about this um, skin project. Uh, the skin's a really interesting uh, barrier site. Uh, we um, it's not classically a mucosal um, site, which is where um, a lot of our interests lie, but it's uh, as important. It's a, a huge barrier surface that has um, its own microbiome. Um, it has this complex ecosystem with uh, lipids and immune cells and cells at different stages of, of maturation, which ultimately form not only a chemical barrier, but a physical barrier, followed by an immune barrier. Uh, and the nervous system is intricately woven into into the skin, as you'll know, with uh, with itching and allergic responses. Um, and so, the understanding the the immunology and the host microbe interactions at this site is is really fascinating. And this is a great review, which is in um, mucosal immunology a couple of years ago that uh, you might like to to take a look at if you want to get an overview of how the skin uh, functions similar to a mucosal tissue. But the question that we asked um, was about how the gut and gut responses can influence um, the skin. Uh, and uh, this project revolves around um, short chain fatty acids and the way that we would induce short chain fatty acids or a diet which we know um, is generally um, considered healthy uh, and produces short chain fatty acids is a high fiber diet. So we, we fed mice a high fiber diet or a controlled diet and then we expose them to allergens on the skin uh, um, over a couple of weeks. Um, and then we look to see uh, what type of inflammation developed. And this, this model is a, um, a atopic dermatitis-like model. Um, so you get uh, sort of a, um, lesions forming on the, on the skin. Um, you have uh, changes to the TOR, which is the uh, transient epidermal water loss, so barrier integrity. Um, and you have changes to the thickness of the skin. 
um, the epidermal thickness, for example, which you can see here, um, and it, it becomes much thicker when you have uh, an inflammatory response, as you see in atopic dermatitis. Now, the take-home message from um, all the data on the slide here uh, is that mice that were on a high-fiber diet um, were protected against disease. So they had less severe disease, they had less impairment of their barrier, um, and less thickening of, of, the, um, of the epidermis. Uh, we can link that to short chain fatty acids. Most most of the beneficial effects of um, fermentable fibers come through their through their short chain through the function of short chain fatty acids, which are produced when microbes ferment the the fiber. Um, so we took the, a similar situation, but rather than giving fiber, we we just supplemented with different short chain fatty acids. We induced the same type of atopic dermatitis like response, and. We could see that um, the different short-chain fatty acids all had a protective effect, acetate, propionate, butyrate, um, butyrate being the most protective. And I'd have to say that in all of the work that we've done over the years looking at short-chain fatty acids, butyrate is always the one that um, has the strongest strongest effect um, at the lowest concentrations. Um, so we, we continue to just focus on, on butyrate um, for this project. Um, and here you can see the, the inflammation and the thickening of the, the epidermis uh, that you see in, in disease context. If the mice were given butyrate um, just in their drinking water over that period, the disease was ameliorated. And you can see that quantified um, uh, here as well with epidermal thickness. And even if you look at um, IgE in the circulation, um, that was also um, reduced. So short-chain fatty acids in the gut somehow uh, influencing inflammation um, in the skin. So to try to understand um, the mechanisms there, uh, we, we did an exploratory study with just a few samples um, where we took skin biopsies from these mice and we did um, bulk RNA sequencing. Um, and there were um, a number of, of differences, um, as you can see here in the, in the um, heat map. Um, and some of the factors which were reduced were things like uh, granulocyte chemo um, chemotaxis, uh, regulation of immune responses, creatinization, leukocyte chemotaxis. So many of the things that we might expect, and they were essentially linked to inflammation, to uh, creatinocyte um, differentiation, and functions related to um, uh fatty acid biosynthesis, which is a key part of um, that sort of chemical layer that, that binds the, um, the skin and forms a, um, a barrier to, to the external environment. Um, as I mentioned, this was just done with a few samples as an exploratory study. So then we, we did it again, but looking at those hits, we did um, quantitative PCR on, on new samples and more samples at those targets. And we could see that it all um, reproduced. So factors which are involved in inflammation, um, you know, uh, IL-1 beta, classic um, CXCL1, IL-4 receptor type 2 inflammation uh, were all reduced as we'd expect. Um, if we looked at uh, factors that uh, are linked with um, the nervous system, such as um, alpha um, amperigulin, uh, which is a, um, a nerve sprouting factor that favors um, itch, um, and uh, nerve repulsing factor was, was increased, so the nervous system development was, um, was affected. Uh, if we look at creatinocyte differentiation, we can see that creatinocyte differentiation, this is quite important particularly for uh, later in the presentation, uh, was increased in the mice that had um, uh, butyrate in their, in their drinking water. Um, also increased was fatty acid biosynthesis, um, so taken together, the creatinocyte and the fatty acid biosynthesis really indicates that um, there's a promotion of um, barrier integrity and the uh, reduction of inflammation suggests that there's, there's obviously reduced inflammation or the disease development um, is, is reduced. So we started to get some insights into um, the types of pathways that were regulated um, from this gut-derived microbial metabolite. Now, quite an interesting observation, um, sort of a side observation, is if we don't induce disease and we um, we just give the butyrate in the drinking water, um, we could see um, an increase, not a, not a um, substantial change in uh, in barrier thickness, but we could see um, loracrine 
uh, layer uh, being increased. Um, so there, so there was a already a baseline. It's very small, um, but there's already an improvement in barrier integrity. So this is not just a consequence of reduced inflammation. Um, even in the absence of inflammation, this uh, you know, oral butyrate is improving um, skin barrier, um, the skin barrier, which I think is a, a pretty interesting um, observation and probably really relevant for susceptibility to disease, not just amelioration um, of disease. Um, and, and sort of further evidence of that, um, but now looking at um, an inflammatory response, if we look at, uh, we did targeted uh, lipidomics, um, and we can see that um, when we uh, uh, expose the mice to, um, to butyrate, um, particularly during inflammation, we see increased cholesterol production, increase in ceramides. Um, and if you look at really the lipid component of the, the skin, you can see that during disease as well, we see a more obvious change in the, the, the lipid makeup of, of the skin. Um, again, pushing us towards the, the hypothesis that uh, this short chain fatty acid from the gut is increasing or influencing the lipid components um, of the skin at steady state to an extent, but really um, very obvious uh, during the inflammatory context. Um, but how is, it, how is it working? At the moment, we're seeing um, direct effects potentially on the skin, um, but how do they link in with the um, uh, inflammatory immune response? And what we did here was to take... Um, put on the skin the house dust mite, which is the allergen which drives the disease, together with fitzidextrin as a, a way to try to track the um, antigen-presenting cells, uh, which were exposed to the house dust mite. So it's sort of a um, one measurement for trying to have an antigen-specific response. And we can see that the macrophages, the monocyte-derived dendritic cells, the dermal dendri dendritic cells, um, were all reduced in percentage. We could also see reductions in... Um, Things like PDL one on on these cells, which is linked with PDL two, sorry, which is linked with um, type two immune responses. So that makes some sense, but that doesn't tell us whether the um, this was due to a defect on the immune cells, the APCs themselves, or whether this was due to a change in the barrier integrity. So to address that, rather than putting the allergen and fitzidextrin on the top of the skin we injected it under the skin intradermally. And now you can see that all of these um, uh, cells in here, that I'm actually showing um, DQ over, so it's processing of the, um, of the um, not fitzidextrin, but um, over, and there's similar results for fitzidextrin, it's just mislabeled, um, there's no effect at all. So these antigen-presenting cells are actually uh, functioning completely normally. Um, and taken together, this data indicates that it's not so much a phenomenon related to the immune system. This is a phenomenon related to the integrity of the barrier tissue. So we switched then to um, in vitro cultures, and now we're using um, human primary keratinocytes. Um, and when we culture those together in the presence of butyrate, we see you know, very different um, formation of the, of the cells um, as compared to this confluent monolayer, we see these um, cells which are uh, morphologically very distinct. They have less uh, total RNA, less protein content. Um, and actually, this is this, these are all characteristics of um, sort of terminally differentiated keratinocytes. So this suggested to us that um, the butyrate was driving the differentiation of these cells to a more mature form which is characterized partly by reduced RNA and protein. If we look at um, electron um, microscopy, we can see that um, there are more frequent um, tonofibrils, um, lysosomes, um, enlarged mitochondria, uh, and degenerating nuclei. Um, and if we look at um, by um, PCR, at a collection of markers relevant for differentiation of creatinocytes, we can see that butyrate is really pushing uh, the maturation of these cells. So um, overall, on multiple levels from um, just the cell culture, light microscopy to electron microscopy to RNA and protein, um, butyrate really seems to drive the differentiation of keratinocytes. Um, so 
Butyrate's affecting the keratinocytes directly. It's directly affecting the um, the, the barrier surface. But um, there are a number of ways that short chain fatty acids function. Um, and one of the one of the effects, although we rarely see it in our um, investigations, but one of the effects is that um, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, uh, HDAC inhibitors, um, VPA is a uh, prototypic, very strong HDAC inhibitor. Um, so we compared um, butyrate to VPA in, in cultures um, to see whether or not um, they induce a similar type of response. So maybe this could be linked to HDAC inhibition. Um, but in fact, as you can see with all of these um, markers of um, keratinocyte maturation um, or the total RNA um, or uh, uh, mitochondrial function, the, the uh, how the cells um, look under the light microscope, as I indicated before, from the confluence to the more segregated mature cells, uh, size and granularity, all of those factors that we know um, are increased by butyrate were not increased by VPA. So this data is not um, direct proof that there's no HDAC activity in these, um, that this phenomenon is not um, re related to HDAC activity, but looking at a prototypic HDAC inhibitor, it, it doesn't do the same thing. So we think it's unlikely that there's any role for butyrate and HDAC, um, it's HDAC activity in, in this phenomenon. Um, so the next idea that we had was that um, butyrate might be fueling the cells and energizing them in a, in a different way. Um, and one way we know that this can occur is by plugging into the TCA cycle and essentially energizing the cells. So when we did um, uh, um, metabolomic analysis of keratinocytes that have been stimulated with, with butyrate, and then we look at the pathways which are driven, um, we can see that uh, the TCA cycle is one of the, the key pathways that's um, that's regulated, um, as to is um, very long chain fatty acid production, which is which is highly relevant from a skin biology perspective. And probably one of the you know it's only a single panel, but it's one of my favourite experiments we've we've ever done. We used um, radio labelled butyrate. We gave it um, orally to mice. And then 45 minutes after giving the radio-labeled butyrate to the mice, we took the keratinocytes from the skin of the mice and we did um, mass spec to, to see, um, to measure the, the um, labeling, so where the butyrate had gone and whether it was um, integrated into any particular pathways. And in fact, we found that within 45 minutes, you could see the butyrate that had been given into the gut was actually already within the TCA cycle of keratinocytes. And I think that's really cool because it just speaks to the speed in which gut metabolites go throughout the body and not just go throughout the body, but they're integrated into cells and change their function. Or in this case, it's actually powering the um, differentiation and function of those cells. Um, 45 minutes was the earliest time point we looked at. And I wish we would go back and um, look at a faster time, at an earlier time point, because this could be happening even faster than 45 minutes. Um, but suffice to say that it occurs within minutes, not hours. Um, so really, really fast. Um, so that that's, brings me to the end of this, this first part of the um, presentation. Um, and the message here is that um, short chain fatty acids, and um, no doubt there are many other metabolites which um, will have effects on the skin, that are, metabolites that are produced in the gut have effects on the skin. Um, and short-chain fatty acids, and particularly butyrate, um, have a couple of functions. One, we do know that um, they regulate inflammation um, in multiple other models. We know that in general, um, butyrate and short-chain fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. But the, the novel part of this um, work was that uh, the short-chain fatty acids really quickly get to the skin with, where they influence keratinocyte metabolism. Um, they do that by integrating into the um, into the TCA cycle. They also, interestingly, increase, as I mentioned, long chain fatty acids. Um, and overall, the, the the output of this is that the skin barrier develops faster. It's healthier, um, and it's protecting that the improved barrier function in the skin protects these mice at least 
um, against allergen uptake and um, the subsequent development of, a, of an allergic response in the skin. So I'm gonna change gear um, now and talk about a completely different story since um, probably about halfway through. Um, and this story um, is also related to the gut, but um, but more in the context of, of the lung. So our lab does a lot of work on um, different types of perturbations. So I've talked about um, fiber and we do different types of diets uh, to see how, how that influences uh, the microbiome and how the microbiome through metabolites influences different types of diseases. And um, there are some uh, epidemiological links um, beyond diet, um, which uh, are linked with protecting against inflammation. One of those is growing up on a farm um, and uh, raw cow's milk um, and aspects of components of that um, have been shown to have effects on the microbiome and protective effects against um, particularly allergies. But one of the most dramatic things that you can do to the microbiome um, is expose it to antibiotics, which uh, really uh, in a pretty um, unspecific way um, wipes out lots of microbes. Um, and so this, this project is related to, um, to antibiotics and the effect that that has. And the reason that we were interested in this is we know that early life antibiotic use um, is one of the major risk factors for the development of allergies later in life. And there's this really nice paper that came out from Stuart Turvey's lab um, last year where they, um, they looked um, at their cohort at different types of factors which were linked with the development of allergy. Um, and antibiotics by one year was the strongest, one of the strongest um, factors uh, that predisposed to, to one allergy or more than one allergy. And this is, rela this is relevant for food allergies, atopic dermatitis, asthma, and, and allergic rhinitis. So overall, there's quite strong um, epidemiological data um, that um, indicates that particularly recurrent use of antibiotics, and particularly when that occurs in the first year of life, that that is a risk factor for developing allergies um, later in life. So we, we established a mouse model to try to understand the mechanisms that, that could be involved um, with this. And this was the model. Uh, we took mice and we gave them antibiotics um, at weaning, so the, the pretty young um, early life mice. Um, and then once we'd finished quite a, a, a um, substantial impact on the microbiome, um, we just co-housed those mice with the with the other mice in the experiment. We mixed up all the cages. So what happened then is um, over a period of um, you know seven, six or seven weeks, um, the microbiome was normalized um, and the microbiome became the same uh, between all mice in the experiment. Um, but some of those mice, the antibiotics treated as they were developing, they had had a disturbed microbiome. Um, but then once they all look exactly the same, we give them house dust mite into the airways now, and this induces a response which is similar to an allergic asthma response, so driven by uh, type, a type 2 driven response. So first, just looking at the microbiome in the setting, as you would expect, um, when we uh, have treated the mice with antibiotics, we see a massive drop in the diversity of the microbiome. Um, the load of the microbiome in the system is also really reduced, um, but it bounces back really quickly. Um, already within one week, you can see that there's a massive uh, restoration in diversity. And by the time we start our exposure to house dust mite, um, the uh, microbiome diversity is, is uh, normalized. Um, we, we looked in great depth. Uh, this is just 16S data here, but we looked in uh, a lot of shotgun, metag uh, shotgun metagenomics as well um, to try to look for a specific microbe which might um, not normalize. Um, and in this system, we failed to find any difference at all um, at this, these late time points. So it really, the microbiome gets heavily affected and then it normalizes and we cannot detect any um, any difference in the microbiome after that point. But even though those the microbiome had normalized, when you look at the magnitude of the allergic response, and perhaps one of the best things to look at is the eosinophils here, which is one of the, the main readouts for this model, 
um, the mice which had had antibiotics early in life were more susceptible or had a greater um, propensity to drive an allergic response on exposure to house dust mite later in life. And every readout was, was along these lines here, synfils, um, dendritic cells, type 2 cytokine production, uh, dendritic cell activation states. You can see histologically uh, peribronchial and perivascular um, inflammations really increased. So um, very similar to um, what we expected and what's in the, the um, epidemiological data, early life antibiotics to increase the risk of, of asthma. Um, and a clear distinction from what we're doing here compared to, to earlier studies which gave which have given antibiotics and allergens at the same time, this is much later on when everything else is, is normalized. And sort of to speak to that, we spent probably a couple of years um, of uh, soul-destroying um, work um, by some postdocs, postdocs in the lab where we looked at every possible parameter we, we could um, to find a difference and try to understand the mechanism and, um, and kept getting just negative data after negative data. So if we just looked broadly at like white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, no difference at all. If we look at every type of immune cell that we can um, detect by uh, flow cytometry, whether it's dendritic cells, IOCs, Tregs, dendritic cells, all completely normal. If we looked at the function of these cells, um, they were completely normal. If we looked at permeability of the gut, it was normal. If we looked at inf systemic inflammation, it was normal. If we looked at leakiness of the lung, it was normal. So it was a really hard um, uh, period of time for the project because we just generated so much data and it was all negative. Um, and I have to admit that at the time we we were considering whether we should stop the project because we couldn't couldn't figure it out. But what we thought um, was to go back to the to the beginning um, of the Im immune response a little bit. So we we took the model where we gave antibiotics um, and then we co-housed the mice and then we start the exposure to the house dust mite. Um, so that very first exposure to the allergen, and we looked two hours after that. So this is really early on at the start of, um, of an immune response. Um, and actually we could already see that the phenomenon um, was was present. So there was already an increase in, in monocytes. There was already an increase in um, the chemokine CCL20, which draws in dendritic cells and, and some lymphocytes. Um, neutrophil numbers were starting to, to increase. So we got our first clue that something is happening very quickly, um, which suggested it was probably something linked to the airway epithelium. Um, so we, we did a very messy experiment next. We um, enriched, we digested the lung tissue and enriched it for uh, stromal cells. Um, so it wasn't a pure population, but it was enriched for structural cells, or epithelial cells, for example. Um, and we either had um, no stimulation, uh, house dust mite or LPS to really push the system. Uh, and we found that um, that all of these stimuli um, increase chemokine production um, by, by structural cells. And even just putting them at these structural cells into culture increased some chemokines. Um, so it suggested this wasn't uh, classical immune cells, but it was probably related to the epithelium, which is the first cell line, that cell that's uh, reacting to, to um, exposure. So then we did the experiment properly. We, um, we purified the cells. We did single cell RNA-seq. Um, and, and it really became obvious that the differences between the groups, if you look at this panel D here, were, suddenly became very obvious between mice which had had antibiotics or had not, and these cells that were showing the, the change in um, gene expression were, um, were epithelial cells, 82 um, cells predominantly. If we look at the pathways that are regulated by these cells, um, the vast majority of them were linked to uh, cellular metabolism, um, the TCA cycle, mitochondrial related genes. Um, nearly all of the cells were, that were affected were 82 cells, but there were also other structural cells, ciliated and secretory cells, which did have differences. Um, they had less differences, um, the highlighted here in these heat maps. And the majority of the differences that they had as well were related to mitochondrial function. So it really seemed to us at this point that it was mitochondrial function uh, that was affected in, in epithelial cells predominantly um, from the early life antibiotics. 
So to dig into that a little bit further, we um, did some flow looking at mitochondrial ROS production by epithelial cells, and we could see that straight after antibiotic treatment, so this is before the co-housing, there was an increase in mitochondrial ROS. Um, this was really specific to epithelial cells. Um, we didn't see the phenomenon if you looked at endothelial cells, so it's not just a broad phenomenon related to any structural cell. And the other key thing, and I won't go into this just for time today, but the other key thing is that we did exactly the same experiment, but in adult mice, giving them antibiotics as adults, and we don't see this mitochondrial ROS production. So this is something very specific to early life. Early life antibiotics leads to this mitochondrial ROS production in epithelial cells, but not in adult mice, which aligns with um, epidemiological data where antibiotics in adulthood doesn't seem to have an effect. And indeed in our system, if we gave antibiotics to adult mice, they didn't increase their susceptibility to, to the allergic response. Now, if we look later, and this is after co-housing of the animals, um, so the microbiome is completely normalized. It's uh, you know, six or so weeks after the antibiotics had finished. Um, and now we look at the mitochondria and we can see that um, there's an increased number of um, dysfunctional mitochondria in the airway epithelial cells. The baseline mitochondrial ROS production hasn't, um, is no longer increased. Um, if they're stimulated, it does increase more. Um, but uh, we think that the early life mitochondrial ROS production is causing damage and dysfunction of uh, mitochondria, which is maintained um, then throughout life. And you see these dysfunctional mitochondria in airway epithelial cells at the steady state of mice that had antibiotics early in life. So aligned with that, we, um, we did untargeted metabolomics. And if we just look at panel A, um, this um, uh, cysteine glutathione um, disulfide is, a, um, uh, is known to be upregulated under um, uh, oxidative stress. Um, and so it's steady state in the, in the airways. We could actually find an increase in this um, metabolite, which just goes in further support of the fact that um, there has been oxidative stress or there is a level of oxidative stress uh, it's steady state in, in these um, animals that have had antibiotics. But to try to understand um, the mechanism of why this had happened and, and could we stop it, we looked um, with our untargeted metabolomics in the serum, and we found there were actually very few hits, um, mainly because the um, you know, this was steady state and it was qu quite a long time after the um, antibiotic treatment. But one metabolite really stood out, and that was um, indole 3 propionic acid, or IPA. So we, we developed a targeted assay for IPA to make sure that our untargeted approach in this data was real. And indeed, um, we could quantify it, uh, and antibiotic treatment completely reduced IPA levels um, early in life. Um, and the IPA levels were restored back to normal um, Later in, later in life. So it was just a phenomenon that occurred early. We did shotgun metagenomics, uh, and we could see that the genes involved in tryptophan metabolism to um, IPA were also reduced um, in animals, uh, in the microbiome of animals that had, had, uh, that had uh, antibiotic treatment. So uh, we could really link the fact that the, the antibiotics had changed the microbiome, that had changed the genes and metabolic pathways which were there, which had the consequence of having a reduction in this um, metabolite in the circulation. If we took IPA and now we've switched to human cells and it's a human um, airway epithelial cell line, then we look at the, the, the effect of um, IPA on um, uh, respiration and mitochondrial um, superoxide production. And we can see that um, when we stimulate these uh, epithelial cells in vitro with house dust mite or with LPS, um, we see an increase in superoxide production. Um, and as we titrate in the IPA, we're um, reducing that. And we can see the same with the respiration um, of, of these cells. So in vitro and in human cells, uh, we can see that um, IPA can function to reduce mitochondrial um, superoxide. So the next, um, really the final aspect of this work was to see whether or not um, IPA treatment um, in mice um, had an effect, whether this was the phenomenon, uh, this was underpinning the phenomenon we were seeing. 
So the experimental setup was exactly the same as we've done previously. We treated mice with antibiotics. We co-housed them to normalize everything. We then exposed them to house dust mite, and we looked at the inflammatory response at the end. Um, but what was different is that only during this period of time early in life, when we, they had antibiotics, we also gave them IPA in drinking water. So they still lost their microbiome, um, which you can see um, here in, in this um, PCA plot, um, that the um, early life antibiotics microbiome um, is very different to that of, um, uh, I'm sorry, no, that's, that's a different data. The, um, the microbiome did um, uh, was depleted and um, the only change was the IPA. And when we gave that IPA, we were able to restore the um, mitochondrial uh, function um, and uh, reduce the um, superoxide production. And this PCA plot is, is uh, related to gene expression. Um, of the epithelial cells. And you can see that the control here, the, the water compared to the mice which had early life antibiotics, the gene expressions are very different. Um, but if we um, were to give the antibiotics and to give the IPA, um, you can see that that gene expression is no longer different. So, um, and you can see that with the heat map as well, very clearly just the, just the um, addition of that one metabolite was sufficient to um, protect against the changes in, in mitochondrial function um, and in gene expression um, in the airway epithelium. Um, and again, this is the, the same experimental setup, but now we're looking at the disease induction. Um, and if you look at total cell counts, or again here, if we, if we look at the eosinophils being um, one of the key cell types involved in this model, um, the gray bar is uh, a normal response the, the blue bar is if the mice had antibiotics early in life, and the red bar is if they had antibiotics early in life, and it was then in addition, they had exposure to um, an IPA during that period, they were protected. And you can see that very clearly with the histology too. So that, that brings me to the end um, from, um, from this project. Very similar to what we have, has been reported in... Um, in human epidemiological studies, early life antibiotics increases the risk of development of asthma later in life. And we think um, our data suggests the mechanism involved here is that um, the antibiotics um, influence the, the gut microbiome. Uh, I haven't gone into it, and we don't have direct proof of it, but uh, one of the key um, IPA-producing um, bacterial families is uh, Clostridia. Um, and when we looked at specific the, the kinetics of um, restoration of certain um, bacteria. There were a number of Clostridia species which were delayed in their um, in their recolonization, uh, which aligned with the production of IPA. So we think it could be related to some Clostridia species in particular. Um, but as a consequence of the antibiotic treatment, the microbes are down. Their production of indole three propionic acid is down, um, and uh, in the absence of IPA, as the lung, we think possibly whilst it's developing in this early stage of, um, of, of life, um, the absence of IPA is, means that there's a dysregulated production of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, and this leads to mitochondrial damage, and that damage is then sustained um, until uh, throughout life, increasing the responsiveness of the airway epithelium to exposures such as house dust mite and driving increased um, inflammatory responses uh, later in life. So our dream here would be that maybe um, IPA, which is a, a natural metabolite, which is generally regarded as safe, so it has grass status, it's a safe um, metabolite that you can consume, um, could be given at the same time as antibiotics to children early in life and maybe that could fortify the, the lung environment and maybe other environments as well, protecting it against um, damage and consequently increase susceptibility to diseases uh, later in life. So to come back to, um, to this original slide, um, the, the gut uh, and the, the gut microbiome and the metabolites that, that are produced there have profound effects locally, but they also touch on pretty much every other aspect of, of our body and our immune system. I haven't talked about the brain, but there's a lot of literature about um, how different metabolites, uh, short-chain fatty acids are one of them, 
um, can influence um, uh, behavioral um, behavior, neurological conditions, immune cell function in the brain. Um, and I've shown you also that it affects the, um, these metabolites can also affect the skin and within minutes of them being produced in the gut, they can be influencing what happens uh, in the skin. And importantly, it's not all related to um, immune cells. Um, as I think a lot of the literature and historically we've thought, the, um, the structure on stromal populations and different tissues, such as the lung and the skin, are directly affected by these metabolites. So metabolites are having a profound effect upon you know, barrier integrity and, and how um, our organs, our mucosal sites or our barrier tissues um, are being fortified or reacting against um, environmental exposures. Um, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, some of the key people who are involved. Um, Glenn Westall and uh, Nicola Harris um, co-lead uh, the Mucosal Immunology Research Group with me um, here in Melbourne. Um, the skin study was driven by Aurelian Trumpet, who um, was in my Swiss, Swiss lab, and he's still in Switzerland. He's an outstanding uh, scientist who has been involved with the, a lot of short-chain fatty acid work that we've done over the years. Um, Olaf and Thomas are, are two postdocs who um, have subsequently gone on to start their own labs in Poland and the Netherlands. Um, and they were both um, heavily involved in the um, IPA story that I was the second part of the presentation. Um, and with that, I'd be very happy to take any questions.